Have you ever watched a remake of a well-respected movie that turned out to be not very good? I know, I know, it's a crazy proposition I'm making here, but, but, but just imagine for a second. Now when that film was over, and you'd established in your mind that it was, in fact, not good, you probably began to ask yourself why that was. If the original was so good, your first instinct may be, What the fuck? It's the same case. Do the same thing. And while that may seem logical to just copy what worked well the first time around, most remakes are at least aware of the notion that doing so would just call into question the film's existence in the first place. But what about those movies that do copy their originators virtually shot for shot? Since we understand why, on a base level, these endeavors are so rare, why do any of them exist at all? What motivates a filmmaker to recreate a previously successful film with nothing but a new shiny coat of paint? That's what we're going to look at today, so strap in for a hard double take as we examine the rare phenomenon of the shot for shot remake. Before getting into the nitty gritty, we first need to define what a shot for shot remake actually is. On paper, it seems pretty obvious. A shot for shot remake is a film that remakes another with virtually no changes. But that key word, virtually, really muddies the defining boundaries here. If we only consider the shot for shot remake to be a film that recopies the original in every respect, from framing to the pacing to the blocking of actors on screen, then pretty much no film would actually fit into that criterion. Even with the most conscious efforts to stick to the blueprints laid out before them, Films can't help but diverge in some natural ways, either because tiny differences in an actor's body language will slightly shift the pacing of their movements, or because, for practical reasons, it may be impossible to recreate every single element of a previous shot. So at this point, we understand that, in the most literal terms, a shot-for-shot -shot remake is basically impossible, unless you're talking about animation where every single element on screen can be manipulated down to the tiniest detail. And yet, the term still persists. So what is it that defines a shot-for-shot -shot remake? And at what point do changes begin to diverge into the territory of something like homage? This is where citing some examples would be helpful, so let's take a quick look at two horror films that were remade decades after their originals, Gus Van Sant's Psycho and Werner Herzog's Nosferatu. Van Sant's Psycho is pretty much the poster child for not only shot-for-shot -shot remakes, but also the pointlessness of the practice. Shooting from the same script as Alfred Hitchcock's 1960 classic, the film may not be perfectly able to emulate every one of Hitchcock's shots to a T, again notice the slight differences in pacing and framing, but Van Sant's clear effort to recreate even the most iconic visuals of the original film indicate that he's going for the exact same effect. When asked why the hell he would even bother remaking such a beloved and iconic piece of cinema with no new ideas of his own, Gus Van Sant's justification essentially boiled down to a cynical, I don't know, why not, I felt like it, fuck you. Nosferatu the Vampire, va va Vampire? Is, is it Vampire? You know what, Vampire sounds cooler so I'm gonna go with that. Nosferatu the Vampire is Werner Herzog's recreation of F.W. Murnau's seminal horror classic from 1922. And if you think remaking Psycho is a ballsy move, try tackling what many believe to be the first ever landmark horror film, said to have been so frightening at the time that lead actor Max Schreck was largely rumored to have been an actual vampire. Nosferatu. As we all know though, Herzog is nothing if not a daredevil with a knack for experimentation so the prospect of tackling what he himself refers to as the greatest film ever to come out of Germany seemed like a fun challenge. As a film, Nosferatu the Vampire certainly borrows heavily from the imagery of Murnau's original, as some shots are, indeed, recreated almost identically. Narratively speaking, the film mostly covers the same ground, and, most notably, some of the most famous scenes from the original are included once again. But Herzog's grasp of atmosphere and tone is so vastly different from Murnau's that the film feels very much like its own thing. While Nosferatu is shot like a silent film from 1922, Nosferatu the Vampire feels very much like a Werner Herzog film. Even the recreated scenes are shot and lit with a sort of erraticism that feels far more inclined with the new German filmmaker than the more rigid stylings of the silent film. So, to recap, while Gus Van Sant's Cycle feels like the watered-down Hitchcock film that it is, offering no new creative choices of its own, Nosferatu the Vampire is certainly an homage rather than a shot-for-shot -shot remake, 
thanks to the unique properties that Werner Herzog incorporates to help marry Murnau's choices with his own sensibilities as a filmmaker. With those baseline differences established, we can now ask ourselves how the shot-for-shot -shot remake is performed under differing circumstances. First, you have the soulless recreation of every previous decision, such as Psycho or Jon Favreau's flavorless Lion King remake that somehow retreads every significant idea from the first film, but worse and a half hour longer. But then you have something like the Evangelion rebuild series. For those who don't know, Neon Genesis Evangelion was an anime series made in the 90s by Hideaki Anno which, in the mid-2000s, he decided to remake in film form. Now across the four-film saga, the Evangelion story takes a vastly different route from the show as early as the second film. But for the purposes of this analysis, that first remake film, You Are Not Alone, does recreate many scenes from the first half of the show, leading up to the point where the two stories diverge. Before that splitting off point, these scenes and images are redone identically, as with this being an animated film, each detail can be artificially touched up to match up the original to make this a shot-for-shot -shot retread in the most literal sense. Given where the series eventually goes beyond the first film, this recreation is at least justified on a narrative level. Although, your reaction to it will depend entirely on how you receive these new changes across the entire film saga. Personally, I found the four-film story to be a vast detraction from the original show, so by the end of it, the remade first film felt like a complete waste of time, but that's my own problem. Perhaps the most common example of shot-for-shot -shot remaking, like regular remaking, comes in the form of English-language remakes of films made in other languages. One remake of a foreign language film that almost never gets discussed is Sebastian Lelio's recent remake of his own magnum opus Gloria, Gloria Bell. Like some other examples, Gloria Bell isn't an exact carbon copy of Gloria, but the similarities are so striking, right down to its notable shot compositions, that I'd say the shot-for-shot -shot label applies here. Here, we have an example of a remake that, in itself, is perfectly fine, but on a macro scale seems to have no reason to exist. It's not a stale recreation like Van Sant's Psycho, but with Gloria already existing, Gloria Bell seems to have only been made for the same cynical reason most international films are remade in English, because Americans hate reading subtitles. Julianne Moore is wonderful in the title role, so the film does work as an exercise for her talents, and Lelio himself, to his credit, avoids the pitfall that most directors reach when remaking their own films for American audiences, which is to butcher the narrative with detrimental changes. But the lack of any changes to the story just sort of makes Gloria Bell seem like an all-around harmless but ultimately useless film. It doesn't take anything away from the original Gloria, but neither does it add anything to the conversation besides justifying lazy American viewing habits. And you are the same filmmaker. Why would you put the camera somewhere else? And I stopped fighting trying to differentiate the new version from the first version. Gloria Bell was a noteworthy case because this was an example of a director remaking their own film. This isn't entirely uncommon practice, specifically when it comes to making a jump between languages or from the silent film to sound. When most directors remake their own films, however, they tend to take the opportunity to introduce new, often worse, elements to the narrative as a means of justifying their choice. Lelio didn't go that route, but in that regard, he wasn't alone. Which leads to the most notorious example of a shot-for-shot -shot remake. That's right, you knew this was coming. When discussing the shot-for-shot -shot remake, there's really no way to avoid discussing Mikhail Haneke's funny games, because this example has been confounding audiences for over 10 years. Haneke's original 1997 funny games instantly came out of the gate as a polarizing experimental film consistently toying with audience expectations of horror cinema, and seemingly trying to actively piss people off throughout the runtime. The film was always intended as a commentary on the consumption of violence in American media, but most people who saw the film were too caught up in Haneke's handling of that message to let it sink in. So when it was announced that, 10 years later, Haneke would be revisiting the material with an American cast, many critics were excited to see him take a new approach to his promising setup for a media critique. And then they got the exact same thing a second time, but with Naomi Watts and Tim Roth instead. Funny Games especially seems like the most meticulously designed shot-for-shot -shot remake ever to exist, with every single camera angle and decision trying to be matched up as perfectly as humanly possible. 
Once again, audiences were divided on Funny Games, or Funny Games US as it's colloquially addressed, as it pissed off a new generation of filmgoers for the same reasons as the original, while also pissing off viewers of the original who felt like Haneke was trolling them into revisiting what they already hated once before. What makes Funny Games such an interesting case is that, on the surface, Haneke's decision to remake his Austrian film in English and set it in the States, like Gloria Bell after it, seems to be a cynical move meant to appease illiterate stateside viewers. And in a way, it kind of was, only Haneke is far more upfront about his intentions than you might think. As I mentioned, Funny Games was always intended to be a critique of violence in the media, targeted directly at an American viewership. Haneke has stated several times that he always intended to make Funny Games in the United States, but for practical reasons, he just couldn't get the film made there at the time. So, he settled for his native Austria. But when his name started carrying some weight overseas, and Naomi Watts approached him with the desire to collaborate, Haneke saw the perfect opportunity to re-envision Funny Games in its intended form, for its intended audience. As it turned out, that re-envisioning turned out to be… the exact same vision. Having already made the precise critique he wanted to make the first time around, Haneke used the opportunity of an English language remake to simply package the exact same critique onto the intended platform that would be palatable for the viewership he'd always been trying to reach. Of course, Funny Games, like its predecessor, didn't set the box office on fire, and hasn't had that much of a wider reappraisal since. If Haneke's goal was to force America as a whole to re-examine its relationship with violence, then Funny Games was a clear failure. But if he managed to make even one American viewer reconsider their stance on the issue, then the Austrian sadist would probably consider the entire effort to have been worthwhile. Does the Shot for Shot remake need to exist to get this message across? Arguably not, but given the very specific road Haneke was trying to navigate, there's at least a justification to be found beyond simple trolling. While the Shot for Shot remake seems, in principle, to be a calling card for lazy filmmaking, there are actually a number of different methods and reasons for filmmakers to go about it. Whether or not these decisions are always justified is up for heavy debate, but at the very least, the conversation is worth having. So, the next time you see a remake that looks suspiciously like its inspiration, it may do you some good to do like the adapting filmmakers and take a second look. Thank you all for watching this video as always, feel free to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and comment below with your own favorite or least favorite Shot for Shot remakes. Until the next time, stay safe and, as always, I'll see you when I see you.